Genesis chapters 1 through 12 are oftentimes referred to as um, the overture of the scriptures. And if you want to use the imagery of a musical, okay, again, if you go to the Muni, uh, typically the performance begins with an overture. And an overture will have a medley of the tunes that will be heard, the melodies that will be heard throughout the um, musical. Okay, so Fiddler on the Roof, there will probably be, you know, if I were a rich man, tradition, sunrise, sunset, you know, it's all kind of a medley of that. And uh, so these are melodies that you'll be hearing later. It sets the tone for the performance. In many ways, what we have here in Genesis 1 through 12 is also an overture because there are tunes, there are melodies, if you will, there are themes that set the, the tone for the rest of the scriptures and that are returned to time and time again. Okay? Certainly the message of the fall, the message of judgment, the message of grace. Okay? Um, uh, the, the, the motivation to sin in the garden, that of wanting to become one's own God, um, idolatry. These are themes that rise over and over again. And so this is why it's so critical to know well this particular section of Scripture, that overture that is kind of heard throughout the performance. And uh, it's also an overture because it sets the tone before the curtain opens on the main characters of the Old Testament. And the main characters begins with really Abraham. Okay? So it sets the tone before Abraham is introduced. And uh, this is why uh, there's really not a whole lot of treatment of these characters or these stories in chapters 1 through 11. Okay? Perhaps uh, Noah gets some pretty good treatment, but uh, pretty brief. But then when you get to chapter 12 with Abram, well, Abram goes all the way from chapter 12 to uh, chapter 27. So uh, multiple, multiple chapters. He becomes much more of a character, uh, the uh, main character. And then certainly when you get to Jacob, who is Israel, <laughs> who is the forebearer, if you will, of the people of Israel, another main character. Okay? Uh, this is also called, particularly I should say, Genesis 1 through 11, the primeval history, because it's that prime history, the first history that sets the stage now for uh, the main history that is considered in the Old Testament, uh, which begins around 2000 BC with Abraham. But it's the primeval, uh, perhaps thousands of years before 2000, that is covered in these uh, 11 chapters. And it's interesting as well that uh, these 11 chapters make up only 1% of the entire Bible. Uh, yet they probably cover, again, multiple thousands of years. Uh, whereas the remainder, 99% of the Bible, covers about 2,000 years from Abram to the, the Acts of the Apostles, early church, about 2,000 years total. Okay, but it begins, of course, with the creation. Okay, so if you will turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, very familiar passage where it all starts, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? And so we have now the introduction of the, the creation account. Okay? What we will see now with this creation account is an emphasis upon God's intention for the created cosmos, but also for the crown of his creation, humanity. And it's very, very clear that God has created everything for his own 
will for his own purposes, not selfish purposes, gracious purposes, for his own glory, um, as a God who lives to give. And in the um, crossways imagery, uh, this is always the symbol for God. The circle has been a symbol for God used um, by Christians for many years, a uh, circle being never ending, okay, uh, eternal, never ending. And yet, uh, the arrows that are coming out indicate that um, God just doesn't exist within himself and for himself, that he is a giving God who lives to give, um, that his revelation goes forth from himself and his mercy and compassion, his provision, his providence goes forth from himself. And uh, that's true certainly in his creative activity in creation. So he's created the world, it's his property, and he entrusts it to humanity here in these opening chapters to care for, to rule over, to have dominion over, but that kind of rule is a rule of care, uh, to care for it as God cares for it, because they are in the image of God. And uh, the, the concept of being created in the image of God in the ancient Middle East um, has a sense of steward, being a steward of one, okay? Um, in terms of dominion, of having the image of another, being the steward of another. Uh, that's true also then for human beings, the crown of creation, that uh, we do not own ourselves, but we are owned by God um, and so we are not our own, in a sense, to do as we wish. But we I exist to do as God wishes, his will. And his will is primarily service, to serve others. And as we serve others, we serve God. Again, the great commandments, which are really summarized in one word, Paul says, love. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? So uh, we are to care for ourselves, but also especially others, and use responsibly. Okay? Now this image here depicts God's original intention as well. God is the king. And a major theme of the Old Testament and the New Testament is the kingdom of God. We'll be highlighting that as we go through uh, the Old Testament. And of course, Jesus, when he appeared on the scene, scene one of the first things that he announced is um, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God has arrived, okay, because he is king, okay. But the kingship of God, a classic text, if you're ever wanting to go deeper into this theme, is by John Bright. John Bright, the kingdom of God. Uh, great Old Testament scholar of years past. But God as the king has created humanity, and this is the symbol for male and this is for female, man and woman, okay, to love him. So you've got the arrow, arrow going to him in a relationship with him as he gives love as well. He is the source of love. And love one another, okay? So the arrow, arrow is going towards the other as well. To, to serve others and to serve him, that's the cr created design and intention of God. And as people live out their vocations, you've learned the, the doctrine of vocation, uh, they become, as Luther says, masks of God, created in the image of God, masks of God, his representatives then, um, in serving others, living to serve and care for others. And so then the posture of service as well. That was God's original intention in creation. And so that is all very, very good. God created, and it was very good. Me'ah um, tov uh, in the Hebrew. Uh, that's the conclusion here. And so you see the scene of the pristine creation uh, where there is no unrighteousness. Uh, the curse of sin has not yet fallen on the creation. <coughs> And uh, uh, it is very good. 
Um, that's about as close as Hebrew comes to speaking of perfect. Ma'od tov, very good. So it's a perfect creation. Everything is uh, perfect and ideal. And the crown of the creation then is man and woman, humanity, uh, who are created in his image. Uh, our Lutheran confessions, again, if I might just speak of being created in the image of God, um, have something to say about that. But what does it mean to you uh, that we are created in his image? Uh, that's what we read here um, in um, verse 27 of Genesis 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay? So what does that mean to you, that humanity was created in his image? Any thoughts on that? I think that be referring to the fact that they were sinless. Okay. Okay. And righteous already. They didn't have to. Okay. God is holy, pure, sinless, righteous. And um, they now are reflections of that righteousness as the image of God. That's a major emphasis of our Lutheran confessions in terms of the image of God. Okay. And that image was lost. Okay. That part of the image of God was lost at the fall. Okay. Ambrosia, did you have... I was just going to say that I think that um, being created in his image means um, that he's endowed us with certain characteristics that he has, just for example, the characteristic of being a creator, and okay. that we have the ability to create as opposed to other organisms which do not. Excellent, excellent. So the dignity here, it's a very dignified uh, status and honor to be identified as being in the image of God. And it means more than simply having the righteousness and holiness of God, but also that we display some of the characteristics of God, uh, you know, the premier characteristics as compared to the other created beings, animals, and so forth. Creativity, OK, yeah. Um, a while back, I was watching one of these uh, animal channel programs on what differentiates humans from uh, other primates. And one of the biggest differences, yeah, <laughs> opposable thumb, but is uh, the ability to create, OK? Uh, other primates don't have that ability. And one of the main reasons they found is because they're not able to um, um, properly um, mimic. Even though we talk about monkey see, monkey do, they can do some elementary. But actually, the way we learn, the way we grow intellectually, is we mimic someone else. We imitate someone else. And, and then we develop that skill, and then we can build on that imitation. And they can't really do that. And, and that comes from, you know, enables creativity. So, yeah, creativity, intelligence, okay. What's that? Dominion, right, right, okay. And we see that here in uh, the next verse, Genesis 1, verse 28. God blessed them. <laughs> Notice that's the first thing that he does after creating is bless them. Again, think of that circle with the arrows going out. He lives to give. He seeks to give, to bless. So he blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what is that calling that we have then to be dominion? Okay. Okay, to serve. Can you go deeper than that, or further in Just terms to of keep things, keep things in order, keep things in place? Stewardship. Good stewards. Stewards. Okay. So just as God provides for the created order, 
here in the world, we humans then are also to have dominion over the animals and the plants and so forth in, in, in terms of uh, keeping things in order, um, serving one another through the created resources and so forth. Uh, using those, not exploiting and abusing them, but using them to serve, to serve one another, uh, to show that love for one another. Okay. So there is that responsibility there. Okay. And so in verse 28, then, you do see the first command, if you will, the first commission. So this is kind of like uh, the Great Commission of Genesis chapter 1. Uh, after blessing them, notice he begins by blessing. Then he's, he gives the command, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion. So it's be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, rule over it. Be my managers, if you will, my stewards over it. So that's the command. Now, the command is law. Okay. The um, blessing is gospel. Okay. Why do you think he begins here with gospel, blessing, and then law? Wouldn't God be a far better Lutheran if he started with law and then gospel? Well, we haven't broken the law yet at this point. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, really, the law is not a condemning law here, okay, because there is no sin. And really, this shows kind of the pattern of God's blessing, gospel. And then he gives us the law to respond to his blessing. It is a guide. So, in a sense, all you have here is really the, what we, we would call the third use of the law, that God guides us. It's the guide for how to respond to his blessing with that law. Okay. So this is what happens. Uh, now, particularly in Genesis chapter 1, it's very, very cosmological in its construction. What I mean by that is that it's covering the whole cosmos as opposed to chapter 2, where it focuses in simply a very local, specific, personal context of Eden and Adam and Eve, and the relationship between God and the crown of his creation, these two people. Okay. But chapter 1 is very cosmological, very universal, if you will, um, in, it, in its scope. It's also fairly liturgical. It has a kind of order to it. And uh, uh, the scholars who have looked at this say that there, there's almost like a liturgical structure of, of, of uh, confession, if you will. <laughs> Just like we make confession and do confession in church. There's a confession that is being made, a creed. This is creedal in chapter 1. And so this is what uh, this transparency is reflecting here, that um, remember Moses is the one, <coughs> as, as we understand it, <coughs> who <coughs> excuse me, has written down the Pentateuch, the first five books, the Torah, including Genesis, um, certainly by divine revelation, direct revelation, but probably also from uh, stories that have been passed down uh, from parent to parent. Um, but he is writing this also under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit after coming out of Egypt, okay? probably sometime during the wilderness wanderings. He's, he's writing this. And so the creation account in Genesis 1 is a confession of faith that rejects the confession of faith in terms of how creation took place from the neighboring societies, including Egypt, where they came from. Okay? In Egypt, the supreme god was who? 
Do you know who the supreme god was in Egypt? Ra. Okay? Ra. If you go see the mummy movie, uh, <laughs> the original one, you'll hear all about Ra. And, so, and Ra was what kind of god? God of what? The sun. The sun god. Okay? Well, you can understand why Ra was such a supreme god, because everything's kind of dependent on the sun for life. And uh, so in, in their uh, accrediting life, they did, gave credit to the sun. Uh, also, the Nile River was a goddess because this region is all desert, and so the river gives life. Now, the interesting thing about the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, though, is that, <laughs> first of all, God creates the sun. The sun is not a god, not even a lower down the hierarchy god in some kind of pantheon. There's only one god, and the sun does the bidding of the true god, the creator god. And in fact, God creates light before he creates the sun. So it's showing that the true source of life is God. In fact, as we'll see, he creates vegetation, life, before he creates the sun. So uh, again, the source of life, of fertility and growth, this is a confession, is not the sun god, Ra, but it's God himself. He is the source of that. He is the originator of that. Okay. Now, there are some similarities with some of the other creation stories, okay? particularly from Mesopotamia. Uh, the creation account called the Enuma Elish. Uh, maybe some of you have even read that in the ancient history course uh, from college. Um, there are some uh, significant uh, similarities, uh, particularly in terms of separating the waters, how, how the creation took place by the separation of the waters, Tiamat separated. Um, creation of man out of the dust of the ground is another example. Okay, But there are also and more significantly important differences. The differences are, okay, there's one god, not many. There are no goddesses. Okay, This one god is beyond the created order. He's not like the sun, the stars, the earth, the waters, not to be identified with them. There is a distinct separation between the creator and the created. And this is something that will be a hard lesson for Israel to learn throughout its history up until the exile about worshiping only the creator and not the created idols. Okay. Um, and uh, there's an order in, in the Enuma Elish. It's just kind of things happen, kind of happenstance, out of chaos and out of really fights, <laughs> conflict between gods and goddesses. Creation comes about. In fact, the human beings, the first human being created out of the dust of the ground, um, is created in order to um, be a slave of the gods and actually help them in their contests with one another to kind of be the hit man <laughs> for one of the gods. So you can see some very, very significant differences, but there are some similarities, um, such as being created out of the dust, dust of the ground. Uh, where would the similarities come from? Or do you think that happens? I mean, Abram was in Ur before he was, you know, sent by God to to Israel. So I mean, his family line has come from Adam via Seth, and you know that whole. I mean, Adam and Eve had to tell their kids, you know, this is what happened. Sure. I mean, they probably weren't proud of it, but right, right. kids are going to say. You know, well, who was your mommy and daddy? And, you know, they. Right. So the creation stories were passed down, 
And there are some kernels, seeds of truth, of actual remembrance of what happened, passed down from Adam and Eve. But they've been so contaminated and um, adulterated with acriments uh, from polytheism and many gods and so forth that uh, they are no longer true accounts, essentially. But there's still elements uh, from that kind of common memory, uh, ancient memory from what's been passed on. Okay? And that's true. There, there are accounts certainly in Mesopotamia about a great flood, okay? the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh. Okay? Um, uh, it's interesting that you have these flood stories, flood myths, throughout the world, even in America. Okay? Central America, the Mayan civilization, has a significant flood myth. Well, that's all, you know, some memory that goes back from being passed down from generation to generation. But it is, again, uh, Genesis 1 is much more of a rejection then of those other um, uh, creation accounts. Okay? Um, I also would like you to take a look here uh, at kind of the structure of this confession of creation. Uh, that's found in Genesis chapter 1, uh, that is evident in the, the six days of creation here. And in verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1, it says, uh, well, obviously verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now verse 2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep without form and void. So this is where what God starts with, uh, this original creative matter, if you will, resources. But it's without form and void. In the Hebrew, tohu wabohu. And um, essentially what we see now in these days of creation are in the first three days, there's the forming because it's without form. And in the last three days, there's filling because it's void. It's empty. So, in, and, and essentially the um, uh, forming takes place by separation and the emptying by filling. So the separation here uh, is between darkness and light. Okay, so verse 2, the earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the earth. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God separated the light from the darkness. Separation of light from darkness. Okay, by that for me. Now, the second day then, we have a separation between the water below and the sky. So the creation of water, but then separated. Uh, water below, seas oceans, lakes, so forth, and the sky, the atmosphere, the um, uh, vapor layer in the sky. Okay, and that we see in verse 7, okay, or verse 6, actually, you could start, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. Okay, so that's separation. Then in the third day, you have a separation. In one sense, there's the first separation of the dry ground from the water. So that kind of separation. But the dry ground then and vegetation. So verse 9, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. In verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation plants yielding seed fruit tree, trees bearing fruit on the earth. So here you've got then the, uh, um, the forming by separation. So you've got the, the original um, raw material, and God is forming it, separating it by the power of his word, the word which has creative power. In the next three days, though, the last three, you have a kind of filling or populating of what has been formed. 
Okay? So in day four, you fill the separation of darkness and light with lights. The sun, the moon, the stars. So that's why I was saying even uh, there's life even before the sun <laughs> created vegetation because there's already light, the light of God's glory. In day five, then, you have the filling of the water below with sea creatures, verse 21, and winged birds fill the sky. Okay. So what had been separated now is filled and populated. And then <clears throat> on the sixth day, you have the creation of animals and man uh, filling the dry ground, land animals, and then plants for food, which populate the vegetation, if you will, okay, for the service of these other creatures to be eaten. And by the way, the scriptures tell us that um, um, there was no meat being eaten. Animals were not killed for food until after the flood. It's only after the flood that uh, permission is given for uh, animals to be killed and eaten. So everybody's a vegetarian <laughs> before, before the flood. So um, what you see here then is the population, and it's in light of this then, <clears throat> the forming and then the populating, that God gives that command, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay? So he's saying, in your continued stewardship of the earth, you continue to populate and fill it. I want you to, to, to fill. Um, he, he delights in the expansion of the human race and the filling of the earth. But then also rule over it, uh, be caretakers of it in my image. And yet creation is given for them for their use, responsible use. Okay, any questions about this? Okay. Now, uh, when we get to chapter 2 here, you have another, um, what is called creation account. Now, I do not say that, I, I don't necessarily like that, although there is creating going on, but it's really a focus in from the larger creation account um, of what happened essentially during day six. So chapter two essentially then uh, takes a view, wide lens view uh, of chapter one and narrows in, focuses in on specific creative activity of God creating human beings and then commissioning them to um, serve one another and serve him. Okay? Um, so they are not two distinct creation accounts, as many would say. And you probably should be aware, I'm just going to be very, very quick about this. This isn't going to be on the exam, but just kind of as uh, added supplemental bo bonus here. Um, there is a theory um, in what we call higher criticism of the origination of the first five books of, of Moses, okay? uh, which traditionally have been accredited to Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch. It's, it's called the documentary hypothesis. It uh, was originated by uh, a German a scholar by the name of Wellhausen, so it's oftentimes called the Wellhausian theory of the origin of the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible. But it's called a documentary hypothesis because it asserts that there wasn't one single author of these first five books, as tradition would claim, Moses as the author, but essentially four authors. Okay? And they are ascribed the letters J, E, D, 
and P. Okay. J is for the whoops. Yawist. Now we would normally understand that as Y because uh, of the use of the divine name Yahweh. Uh, this is the name that we'll use very frequently because the Old Testament does now too. The uh, uh, direct name of God, the, the true God, Yahweh. E is called the Elohist because of the use of the name of God Elohim. Okay. D is the Deuteronomist, and uh, uh, primarily Deuteronomy is uh, attributed to this, but there are also some pieces in the other four books. Uh, that they would identify. And then P is the priestly. And so when you have a lot of priestly literature uh, describing priestly acts and rites and ceremonies and so forth, such as you find in Leviticus uh, and a lot of it in Exodus and so forth, uh, that's from this source. And it, it, what they're saying is that there were these original sources then that were all put together by some a redactor, some editor, who tried to make it all fit together. And uh, this is all relatively late as well. So uh, the Yahwist was around 900 BC. The uh, Elohist was about 750. Uh, the Deuteronomist is around, well, 622 um, with uh, what Josiah's discovery, it was essentially some say that this was a new document that was planted to be found. And then the priestly one is during the exile. Okay, so that would be 586 and after. So you see that this is much later than is traditionally understood as the date for Moses, which would be around 1500 BC. Okay. Well, without going into a lot of detail, um, uh, <laughs> there are great problems with this, not the least of which is saying that these are all distinct accounts that contradict, and they try to find contradictions. Okay. Um, one of the classic cases here is between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, because Genesis 1 is claimed to be of primarily the Elohist because of the use of the term Elohim for God. And Genesis 2 is the Yahwist because of um, uh, some of the use of Yahweh, but also just the style. Um, and they say that there are contradictions. Uh, for example, in Genesis chapter 2, uh, they say man is created before God plants the earth. Well, that's not a contradiction. It says man is created out of the dust of the ground, and then God plants a garden. doesn't mean that he hasn't already created uh, the other uh, vegetation and so forth, but now he prepares a special garden. Remember, it's narrowing in. Um, so the contra supposed contradictions that are claimed by these uh, people who ad adhere to this are explained if you if you give a sympathetic reading to the text. Okay, the use of different names is understandable because Elohist Elohim is more broadly just God, okay, the supreme being, whereas Yahweh is the um, relational and what we'd call covenantal. name. Okay. And so it makes sense that in Genesis 1, when you've got the broader cosmological creation, that there's going to be uh, uh, the use of this term. Whereas in Genesis 2, when it narrows in on a more personal relationship, God dealing personally with the first human beings, you're going to use this name, the more relational and covenantal name. Um, so I'm just kind of 
giving you a little bit of a preview to this. You're going to get it a lot more thoroughly when you uh, take uh, some of your Old Testament uh, courses later on. But uh, this is a classic case where it appears. What I am saying here is that Genesis chapter 2 then is simply a uh, tel telescoping then of this broader into a narrow focus on the creation of human beings and uh, those being the crown of God's creation. Now there's a couple of important events that take place in Genesis 2 though. The naming of the animals, creation of Eve, and the institution of marriage. Okay, And um, why are these so significant? First of all, the naming of the animals. Why do you think that is so significant? That Adam names the animals. Okay. Kind of introduces language, though, I mean, at that point. Okay. I know that God created with words, but um, you know, the fact that Adam would refer to them using words or language, I think, is significant. Okay, okay. So now the use of words, um, um, just as God uses his word, now Adam, created in his image, uses words now and names the animals. Kind of starts describing names for identifying entities. Good. Yes? I think this is the first time that man shows dominion over a portion of God's creation. Okay, okay. And why is that? Uh, because God gives us the dominion with the, the horizontal. Okay. Okay. So remember, God said, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the beasts, okay, over the animals. This is an exercise of dominion. And in uh, the Old Testament and really in that broader ancient Near Eastern context, to name something is to have dominion over, okay, um, to have authority over. We saw that in chapter 1 already. God called, if you will, he named the light day. Okay? He called the waters below the seas. He names and that demonstrates his authority over. So now as Adam exercising his authority given to him in chapter 1, notice this is a <laughs> shows the continuity between chapters 1 and 2. Adam calls and names, so also he's exercising authority. So he's, he's here exercising the command that God has given to him to have dominion. What about the second part, marriage? It has to do with the filling up the earth, right? Okay. Okay, the filling, the populating. Uh, it's only through marriage now that reproduction, procreation takes place. Okay. So that's the other part of the command. Be fruitful and multiply, he said to uh, the man. Well, you know, you can't do that <laughs> just all by yourself, despite cloning and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And so he brings a woman, but not just for the purpose of, of procreation, to be a helpmate. It's not good for man to be alone, okay? And so the creation of woman described there in Genesis chapter 2, Adam is put into a deep sleep. Um, a rib is re removed, or in the Hebrew it can be kind of the side. Uh, the side is removed. God fashions a woman. And uh, when Adam sees the woman, uh, the Hebrew word for man is ish, and when he sees her, he says, ish, ha, ah. okay, ha, ah, yes. This is a wonderful creation you've made, God. And the Hebrew word for woman is isha, okay. And uh, um, the point is here, she's not distinct from me in terms of these other animals that were brought to me and no helpmate was found. She is one like me, appropriate helpmate. And yet she's different. She's not masculine, ish, she's 
feminine, <laughs> Isha. She's different than Viva la difference. Okay. And then we have at the end there of uh, chapter uh, two, the institution of marriage. Okay. Uh, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. There's the implication here of procreation, father and mother, be united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So, um, the sexes, were, if you will, differentiated by a separation. And the separation now allows for a population. Okay. And yet that population takes place through a union once again, bringing together, if you will, that original one flesh. Okay. But I think what's very important here is that uh, this is an exercise of the command that God gives in chapter 1. To be fruitful and multiply through marriage. And then also to have dominion over the earth. The naming of the an animals here. So you see that continuity between Genesis 1 and cha Genesis chapter 2. So this isn't simply a patchwork of, of uh, disparate creation accounts. Uh, these are integrated. There's a few other um, similarities, and you don't have to write these down, but uh, uh, similarities between the two. Both passages ascribe creation to the free and spontaneous initiative of God, whose disposition is love, goodness, and prov providence. Uh, so they're consistent in affirming that. Second, God brought creation into existence in perfect and effortless cre uh, freedom. Third, the created order is good. Me'ah tov, very good. Um, it's, and uh, throughout history then, particularly among the Greeks and Gnostics and so forth, there has been a despising of the created order. The created order certainly has fallen, but it is still good and uh, to be valued and given thanks for. And will be redeemed as well. All of creation will be redeemed. A humanity is the high point of the creative process, created to live in the closest fellowship with God. People are social beings. It's not good for people to be alone. So we are created to be amongst one another, to serve one another, to love one another. And creation is to serve humanity's needs. Okay? So we're not extreme environmentalists who kind of almost see hum human beings as all being the, uh, um, um, you know, bad guys in, in the um, reality of the environment. Creation is to serve us. At the same time, we are to use and care for God's property responsibly, to be good stewards. So those are some of the, the similarities.